For part six, let's explore some harder examples of probability. Uh, this is a classic problem called the boy-girl problem. So let's say um, a pollster randomly selects a family with two children to interview. What's the probability that the family has one boy and one girl? Well, one way to illustrate this is the first child could either be a boy or girl. The second child could either be a boy or girl. So there's four possible options. Two of them have one boy and one girl, BG and GB. So there's a two out of four or one half chance of getting a boy or uh, getting one boy and one girl. Let's repeat this calculation, but this time the interviewer randomly selects a family with two children but eliminates all the families that have two girls because he wants a family with at least one boy. In this case, what's the probability that the family has one boy and one girl? So we're going to have the same table as before, but we're going to have to cross off the two girls situation. So now there's only three options and two of them have a boy or a girl in there. Uh, sorry, a boy, one boy and one girl in there. So that'd be two out of three. That's really interesting. Um, you do have to be a little careful with this calculation because it depends on how we're eliminating um, those GG group. But if you know one child's a boy, at least one child's a boy, then the probability the other one's a girl is actually two out of three, not one half, which is a really interesting situation. All right, um, the next example explores uh, redundancy. There's um, often, most businesses have built-in redundancy. Really, this is just to decrease their risk. For example, let's say an email server has a 90% chance of working throughout the day. Um, so in other words, not crashing. Um, a company running the server decides that they wanna run three of these servers independently in case one of them fails. So what's the probability that at least one of those servers is running throughout the day? So in other words, what's the probability that the server stays, the combined server stays up and customers don't get angry? So if you think about it, this is a little bit tricky because saying at least one survives means that one could survive, two could survive, or all three could survive throughout the day. That well, instead of calculating three separate things, it might be easier to find um, the complement. So let's do one minus the probability of the complement of at least one surviving, which means they all crash, right? If um, meaning none survive. So let's find the probability they all crash. First, let's find the probability that a single one of them crashes. There's a 90% chance that they work, so there's a 100%, well, one minus 0.9 um, chance that it crashes, or 0.1. So in other words, a 10% chance a server crashes. So we have three servers here all acting independently. So the probability that they all crash would be 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.1. I'll just use the multiplication rule. And that gives us 0 0.001 or a 0.1% chance that all of them crash. Well, since there's a 0 0.001 chance that they all crash, there'd be a one minus 0 0.001 chance that at least one of them survives. Again, the way we set it up, one minus the probability they all crash would be the probability of at least one surviving. So that's a 0.999 chance or a 99.9% .9 chance that at least one of them survives. And this is why um, airplanes have more than one engine and email servers have more than one server, is to decrease the chance that they all go down and they all crash. Um, another thing to look at is a two-way contingency table. Please ignore that comment on the bottom. Um, an instructor was interested if students who attend class regularly are more likely to pass the final exam than those who, do, than those who have poor attendance. So here's a summary of the results. So uh, this is made-up data, by the way. Um, let's see, there's 48 students who had good attendance and passed. There were 15 students who had good attendance and failed. 17 that passed with bad attendance, and 38 that failed with bad attendance. This is called a two-way contingency table because we have two different things we're measuring. We're measuring performance on a test and attendance. All right, so this is just showing all the options, and the total columns were just 
um, like the 63 here was just calculated by adding together the 48 and the 15. This 118 on the bottom is our total sample size, and I just got this by adding the 63 and the 55. Alternatively, I could have gotten this by doing 65 plus 53, but just don't do both. Do one or the other. Okay, so let's find the following. Let's find the probability that a student passes. And then let's also find the probability that a student passes given that they had good attendance and the probability that a student passes given that they had bad attendance. To find the probability that a student passes, there are 65 students that passed out of a total of 118 students. So that will give us a 65 out of 118 chance that a student passes, 55.1% approximately. Okay, for the second part, we want to find the probability a student passes given they had good attendance. So the good attendance is this first line here. There are 63 students that had good attendance and only 48 of them passed. So it would be 48 out of 63, um, which simplifies to approximately 76.2%, substantially higher than the pass rate for the whole class. If we look only at the bad attendance group, only 17 out of 55 passed, which is approximately 30.9%. So from this, since the pass rate changes, in fact, it improves depending on how, if your attendance was good or, well, it improves if it's good attendance, it gets worse if you have bad attendance. So since it seems like attendance and pass rate, uh, final exam performance, um, change the probabilities of someone passing, then we can say that pass rate and attendance are dependent because the probability of pass given good attendance is not just equal to the probability of passing. Okay, so one final example, let's look at the lottery. So suppose that in a lottery you have to pick five numbers out of a total of 60 numbers. Let's say you win the lottery if you get all five numbers correct in any order, and it doesn't matter which order you pick the numbers. Um, let's suppose you also win $200, or you can win $200, if you only get three out of the five numbers correct. So what's the probability that we win the lottery? And um, second part, what's the probability that we get the $200? So to win the lottery, there are 60 numbers and we have to pick five of them, order doesn't matter, and there's only one winning number. So it's gonna be one out of 60, choose five for combinations, um, which I just used a calculator for this, it would be one over five million um, 461,512. Not very likely. <laughs> One out of five and a half million almost. Okay, so let's talk about getting three correct. So our denominator would be the same because there's still five and a, almost five and a half million different options. But we have to pick three correct numbers and there's five total correct numbers to pick from. And again, order doesn't matter. So just be five, choose three. Um, similarly, there's 55 wrong numbers and we have to choose two of them. And again, order doesn't matter, the order in which we choose them. So there's 55, choose two different ways of doing that. Again, I used a calculator, um, 5C3, that's 10 options, 55 uh, combinations, uh, sorry, combinations of 55, choose two would be 1,485. Multiply those, you get 14,850 over a approximately five and a half million, that gives you approximately 0 0.0027, or about 0.3%. Um, so this is much less than 1%. So it's more likely than winning the whole lottery, but it's still not very likely. We're talking about less than three in a thousand people will win the $200.